just having clients kind of come in and what I started really hearing and people would come in with like anxiety and depression and I was just like you know, I'm missing something here, right? It just doesn't sound like traditional anxiety and depression, right? And listen, I know that there's this, the, a concern that like, oh, everyone's just like on TikTok and like Reddit and diagnosing themselves and like, fine. But I also really think it's important that if you are a therapist, a social worker, we are not the gatekeepers. Welcome to Occupation Insights, where we discuss jobs and career opportunities. Today we're here with Sarah. Sarah is a trauma therapist. She received her master's degree in 2015 in social work. And in 2021, she completed a two-year integrated trauma studies program at the Institute for Contemporary Psychotherapy. Hello, Sarah. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm good. I like your earrings. Very oh, colorful. thank you so much. Yeah, I try and bring a little bit of color and personality. Tell us a little bit more about your background. Sure. So I actually got my undergraduate degree, my bachelor's degree in psychology. Um, and then I spent a few years uh, working in various nonprofits, doing sort of administrative stuff. And then I decided I wanted to go back and be a social worker. So I got a master's degree in social work. Um, and I did that. Um, I was a social worker for a few years. I did that for about six years. Um, and I am based in New York City. And so the way that it works in New uh, New York is that you need to get a few accumulate a certain number of uh, hours as a therapist. They're called clinical hours. And so I spent some time accumulating those clinical hours. Um, and then once I did that, I decided to go out and become a therapist full time. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. What do you think influenced your choice in the first place to become a psychologist and then social worker? That's a great question. Um, so when I was in high school, I actually uh, took a class in psychology um, and I loved my psychology teacher. He was just so great. He had such a great personality. He was kind of one of those like no BS kind of guys. Um, and he was really, uh, really made it sound really interesting to like learn about people, right? I really like learn about what makes them tick. Um, and I thought that that was so cool. And so when I went to college and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but all the psychology class it just sounded so interesting um and so yeah that's i kind of just picked it on a whim and was like this sounds really interesting and i want to study this um and so i really enjoyed my classes um but i will say that as a as an undergraduate um, psychology student a lot of the classes were much more focused on like research and kind of you know what happens when you put rats in a maze and stuff like that and i wasn't really that interested in it it wasn't a lot i thought it was going to be much more like what my psychology teacher was so you know like therapy and helping people and all of that stuff and it was a lot more like sciencey um which wasn't really my jam so when i graduated i was like i don't really know that psychology is the path for me so i kind of bounced around a bit and that's why i did some various like nonprofit type stuff um, cause I knew that I wanted to do things that were, that involved like helping people. Right. Um, I, uh, I actually grew up Catholic, so I was raised in the church and um, not like super, super observant. But one of the things that I, I took away from being Catholic, right? I'm not Catholic now. One of the things I took away from it was this really strong sense of service, right? There's this idea that like, that's what we're here for, right? We are here to give back to like, you know, our fellow man. And so that was something that always really drove me and really inspired me. And so when I felt like, I don't really know what to do with the psychology degree, I don't want to help people. So I worked in different nonprofits and through doing that work, I encountered social workers, right? I started encountering people who were social workers and the folks that I met who were social workers, they just seemed, they were really warm. They seemed really caring and the work that they did just seem really important. And so that really prompted me to go out there and to research, well, what is it that a social worker actually does, right? And it seemed to be this degree that allowed you to do a lot of really interesting things and work in a lot of different settings. And so I wasn't exactly sure where I was going or what I wanted to do. I had worked in higher education. I worked um, uh, with folks who were in um, alternative to incarceration programs, right? So like youth who had kind of gotten involved with 
you know, like misdemeanors and stuff. Um, and so we're doing kind of alternative programs. Um, so I was like, well, maybe I want to work with young people. Um, I had worked for Planned Parenthood. So I was like, well, maybe I want to work with reproductive rights. I wasn't quite sure. And social work seemed to be a field that was really going to allow me a lot of opportunities to, to work in different settings, um, but really get to work with people individually, because that was something I also learned, right? I didn't want to be the person you know, in the background, getting the funding, writing the reports, like that didn't interest me. I really liked being on the ground, getting to talk with people one on one, right? Um, I did some volunteering, right? I worked on a crisis hotline. I really loved doing that. And I was realizing that I was craving more long term connections with folks, right? Crisis hotlines can be really great. And you really feel like you're helping someone, but it's very short, right? Maybe it's like, 15, 20 minutes with someone. Um, and so all of that put together made me decide like, you know what, I think social work could be a really great opportunity for me um, to get to work with people and get to help people and figure out the path that's going to be right for me, right? So all that put together, decided to go back and get my master's in social work. When you initially finished your bachelor's and then started working for several nonprofits, what was the selection mindset behind? How did you know where you want to go and where to work? Great question. Uh, I didn't initially. When I graduated, um, one of my... Uh, professors actually offered me a job at the college that I had graduated from because she knew that I was looking for work and wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, and she had a position in the college dean's office. She was starting a, a summer youth program and uh, needed someone to help her start that up. And so she's like, listen, I can put together some money and you know, it's not going to pay very well, but it's, it's something. And I was like, great. Um, so that gave me something to do for a little while. And I liked it. And I liked working with young people. And I, I thought, okay, well, that could be something really interesting. Um, so when I had done that for about a year and was ready to, to move on to something different, um, I looked for other programming, um, working with young people, because I thought like, well, maybe that's something I want to do. So I found this program working with folks in alternative to incarceration programs. Um, because it, it also sort of meshed with my idea of maybe some like social justice right issues and and um i was starting to really learn a lot about um what folks were experiencing a lot of the injustices that, that folks were experiencing that kids were experiencing a lot of the kids that were coming to our college were youth from new york we were a school in new jersey and these were kids coming from new york um and so i was starting to learn about some of the challenges that folks were encountering and so i thought okay well this is a way that i can put my interest in social justice and my interest in working with young people together right um and so it was a good experience to work with that uh community and work with that population um and i learned a lot about I learned a lot about how people make choices um, based on the limited options that are available to them right that these is, weren't bad kids that is you know? a really interesting um, thought for sure do you feel like the fact that you're so close to New York and you live and you work in New York and New Jersey impacted the work that you do where whether as if you lived in a smaller town, smaller city, maybe different state, do you feel like the dynamic of your work would be different as well? Yeah, I think absolutely. You know, I think I have worked with, I think one of the things I really value about my work in New York is that I've worked with folks um, across so many different, you know, income brackets, so many different immigration experiences, so many different um, races and cultures. And I think that's really uh, influenced me in a lot of different ways. I think it's helped me develop a lot of compassion and a lot of understanding for the ways in which people make the best choices that they can for themselves based on the opportunities available for them. And I think it's helped me develop an understanding um, an understanding for people who are kind of who are at the bottom, who are placed at the bottom of society, let's say, right, who are kind of forced into the bottom of society, who are forgotten by a lot of our, um, a lot of our systems, right? Um, because you learn, you know, that these are folks, these are, these are people 
who care deeply about their children. These are people who care deeply about their families. Um, and they are trying their hardest to survive. They are trying to, to, um, to function in a world that is not made for them. And I absolutely think that in seeing that really up close, that has really shaped my perspective on systems um, and has shaped my perspective on uh, the ways in which oppression functions. Um, and I, I can't say, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of folks who work in smaller towns and, and work in different settings who have similar political perspectives than mine. Um, but I do think that for me, having this experience of being in New York City absolutely shaped my political perspective, right? Could not, for me, absolutely. I, 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 I would have felt very differently if I'd been somewhere else. Once you finished your education in 2021, Did you have next steps mapped out? Did you already know what you want to do next? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, right. So I, uh, when I graduated with my master's degree initially in 2015, I, uh, didn't really know, right? Folks are always, <laughs> when you're in graduate school, a lot of people are like, oh, I know exactly what I'm going to do with my MSW. And I was like, I don't know. Um, so I was very fortunate to find an agency that was really wonderful. I was, I really liked them. I, I worked um, at a domestic violence agency serving folks with disabilities. And um, I really liked it. And I thought that it was really supportive and um had a really good mission and um, really was trying its best to serve people and support its staff, right? And that's honestly kind of unusual to find. And I grew a lot as a social worker and as a person, and I really valued it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I knew that I wanted to go and get this advanced training in trauma, right? So I did that, that two-year program you mentioned that ended in 2021, because um, I knew that I, I wanted to develop some more skills, right? Working in domestic violence, those are folks who've experienced trauma. I knew I wanted to learn more about how to support people. Um, and then I knew by the time that ended in 2021, I'd been working in domestic violence for a long time. And I knew that I was kind of burnt out on that, right? And that I was no longer serving uh, the clients in the ways that they needed, because um, I was starting to feel burnt out and that it was time, it was best for everyone, for myself and for the people I've worked with that I move on. And so it happened to be at the same time um, that I saw, so I was thinking, you know, well, maybe, you know, I have this training in, in trauma, like, let's see, maybe it's a good time to see uh, what it would be like to, to be a therapist, right, to really like do that, right, because what I've been doing before was kind of this mix of like, some therapy and counseling and some kind of case management. So helping people find like more concrete services and then doing some administrative type roles, right? So that stuff I said I didn't like doing, but like grants and reports and all of that. Um, so I was like, well, maybe, maybe it's time to really see what it's like to, to just do this, right? And at the same time, I saw... Um, Uh, a listing for this uh, a position at a group practice. Um, so someone who had gone to my same graduate school was um, had just opened a group practice in 2021 and she was looking for therapists, right? Um, and the practice was called liberation-based therapy. And her whole point was, right, looking at this idea of, you know, how can therapy and mental health be a place where we are looking at these larger issues of like oppression and considering these, these larger narratives um, and providing a space for clients, but also providing a space for therapists, right? That is mindful of these larger forces. Um, and so I was like, you know, this sounds like maybe what I'm looking for. And so it was really like a great, uh, great timing in, in where I was and sort of my journey and this opportunity that came up. Cause I, I think a lot of times what happens for therapists is there's this idea of you put in your time, right? You do your work, you work at an agency, you, you get your hours. And then once you get your hours and you can become an independently licensed therapist, you go out on your own, you work in a private practice, right? And to me, I was like, well, first of all, it sounds like a lot of work, right? Because it's a business. And I was like, I don't know if I want to start my own business, but it also sounds really isolating, right? Like I'm just going to sit there and you know, be by myself for hours and hours every single day, the idea of a group practice sounded appealing, because I was like, well, there's going to be some support there, right? So someone else is going to help with sort of, you know, a some of the like advertising and that but there's also a community there, right? So if I feel like, oh, I'm kind of stuck, I don't I need some support. 
I can go to this owner, right? I can go to my colleagues and, and get some support there. Um, so all those things sounded really appealing to me. Um, and so that's why I decided to, to go that route. And so that's, that's how I wound up uh, doing this, which is very us, fun. Tell us a bit more about your day-to-day -day life. What do you do now? Great question. So I've kind of found this, uh, you know, what I do now is I uh, provide trauma therapy to folks. Um, I work with adults. Um, I work with a lot of uh, LGBTQ folks. I also work with a lot of folks who are somewhere on like the neurodivergent spectrum, right? So whether that's autistic, ADHD, um, folks who are sort of highly sensitive, um, that wasn't necessarily exactly who I thought I was going to be working with. But when I started, I was kind of just put myself out there for everyone. Um, but I am someone who identifies as queer and ADHD. And so I think that's just kind of like the universe maybe pulling us all together. Um, so it's been really great. So I uh, see some people virtually, um, there is an office space. So I do see some people in person. And so I meet with folks and we do work on, you know, whatever's coming up for them, right? So sometimes it's going back into maybe some like childhood trauma stuff that's coming up for folks. Sometimes there's issues that's coming up in, you know, their current relationships or work issues that they need to navigate through. Um, it's a lot of meeting people where they are, right? And sort of helping people navigate through that. Um, a lot of my work is sort of focused on helping, especially when we think about neurodivergent uh, individuals, is helping people sort of figure out like, what is the environment that is best for you, right? I think a lot of us feel like we have to kind of contort ourselves to fit into, well, this is where I'm supposed to be, right? This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Maybe I went to school for X, so that's what I have to keep doing, right? Or, you know, I'm supposed to, you know, be making this amount of money, or I'm supposed to be climbing the corporate ladder, or whatever, whatever. And a lot of the work, it, or I'm supposed to be in this relationship, right? And I think a lot of the work um, is, I mean, are you? Is this what's making you happy? And what if it's not, right? And that is terrifying for a lot of us. It's really scary to say, well, what if the life that I'm currently leading is not making me happy? Right? What if this isn't actually what I want? Um, and that can be really scary, but I think it can actually offer a lot of possibilities as well, because it can say like, whoa, I actually get to be in charge of what I want to do. And maybe I'm not actually the weird one, right? Maybe my way of existing in the world is totally fine, is totally normal. And the challenge is just figuring out a way to make that work better for me. Right. So that's a lot of what I try and work on with folks. Right. Is how do we sort of help ourselves feel better about that? Right. Um, so that's the therapy that I do with with folks. Right. So, you know, my day to day, it's usually I have somewhere between like three to six clients. Um, I don't try. I, I usually don't like to have much more than that, um, just because like it's a lot. You know, it's a lot of like emotion. It's a lot of focus and attention. Um, and I want to give my clients like the best therapy that I can. Um, and so if I take on too many clients in a day, like by the end of it, I'm totally, totally drained, right? Um, so I do that. Um, and then some of the other time I also supervise. So I provide supervision to some of the folks at the practice, right? So that's folks who are working towards their licensure. So we'll talk about their cases and sort of troubleshoot and figure out well what's going on, but also what's coming up for them, right? Because therapists are people too, and we're having our own responses. And so understanding how we're feeling about the client or maybe what's coming up in our own lives sometimes that can be really helpful um so that's part of the work um so that's what i do at the practice right and then i also sort of as a little bit of a side gig is i um work for a nonprofit called Miming Your Mind. And we do workshops with students and teachers um, and sometimes uh, like businesses and parents. And we talk about mental health topics, right? So we talk about trauma, we talk about um, what are like feelings and what does it mean to be kind? And we talk about depression and anxiety. Uh, one of our big uh, presentations that we do is we actually pair folks like me, so therapists, 
with young adult speakers who have gone through mental health challenges and we speak to young adults, right? And I, that is a really great opportunity to really normalize and reduce stigma and help educate young people um, and also give a lot of them hope, right? That like it's possible to experience oppression and anxiety and also to get help and to go through to the other side and that it's okay to talk about scary things like self-harm and even suicide um, and that you need to talk about these things right? So that you can get the help and support that you need to. Um, so I really like getting to do that. And I like going into schools and getting to talk to folks. Um, because I think it's really important. It's one of the things that's really exciting about this time. Like when I was a student, we don't really talk about mental health. I don't remember anyone talking to me about depression, anxiety, right? Like what? That was not at all. It was very like, very hush hush, right? Um, so I think it's great that we are so much more open, especially now, right? After having gone through, you know, COVID and shutdown and all of the isolation that students especially experienced, um, you know, we know that kids are really suffering, adults too, of course, right? Um, but I think it's really important that we're offering kids that space to talk about this. Um, so I really like getting to do that. So that's kind of kind of my day to day, right? So it varies, you know, a little bit of a little bit of seeing clients, a little bit of supervising folks, and you know, a little bit of um, getting out there into the community and providing some mental health education. You're helping others in many ways, working with people and communities of different backgrounds. And it seems like you're talking on sometimes challenging and sensitive topics as well, but how do you keep it sustainable and healthy and safe for yourself? How do you avoid that burnout that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, I think that's such a great question. Um, I So first of all, I have my own therapist, and I think that's really, really important um, for anyone in, in the helping professions, right? That you have your own uh, person that you can go to and talk to, right? Um, one thing I've, I've worked really hard on is allowing myself to have my emotions, right? Sometimes after a session, I cry, right? Sometimes I feel sad or angry and i purposely build in time between sessions i have usually 10 15 minutes between sessions so i have time to recenter and do what i need to for myself to check in with myself um, one of the things that i learned um, that i feel really grateful for my training that i did in this trauma program is it really helped me get in touch with my own body and so it helps me pay attention to what's coming up for me physically right so if i'm in session with a client i'm starting to notice like oh i'm feeling I'm feeling something, I'm feeling anxious or sad or scared, right? Um, sometimes it's useful and it's giving me information. And sometimes it's something that I have to be like, okay, I'm going to hold on to this. And then after, you know, the Zoom ends or I say goodbye to the client, like I need to sit and like breathe and maybe I need to like journal a little bit, right? Or sometimes I text a friend, right? Or I go home and I talk to my husband and I say like, you know, it was a really tough session, you know? Um and I reach out to folks and I, and I talk to them about it. But I also take care of my own body. I, uh, I like to do yoga. I like to work out. I, it's really important for me to have spaces where I can connect to my body in ways that I don't have to think, right? Like it is great to have an hour where I don't have to do any of the decision making. I just get to like zone out and like uh, be in my body and be in a space and let somebody else kind of like tell me what to do. Um, and that can feel really healing, and really connecting, right? Um, so that's really important to me. Um, I really love theater. I'm very fortunate to live in New York City. So I love going to, you know, Broadway, I love going to, to, to other shows or concerts. Um, to me, that's really healing. It's a way to be in community with other people, right? And have this sort of shared experience, this shared artistic and emotional experience. It gets me outside of myself. Um, a little bit um, and and uh, and see other people's experiences in a different way and think in a different way. Um, so that's also really important. Um, and also just have fun too, right? Like I do all of this and I, you know, I read about therapy too, but I also like to read my like little, you know, rom coms and you know i like to like watch my like silly little sitcoms and things like that so i think that's important too is like when i notice that i'm doing too much that's about like trauma um is like take a break 
right? And just like read that fantasy novel, right? And do something that's a little silly and fun and um, doesn't require too much thought, right? Um, but yeah, there are days where I notice that I am starting to feel stressed and I'm starting to feel overwhelmed. And like, I might need to like, take a weekend and just kind of do nothing, you know, and it's a constant balance. Um, and I've tried, I've, I've also really had to learn to like, be really mindful of like my boundaries and not accommodate too much, you know, like if folks want to like shift, you know, sessions around, like I gotta make sure I have time for lunch you know, and I can't, I can't see you at nine o'clock at night. I'm so sorry. Um, I need to like decompress and sleep and all of that. Right. Um, so figuring out what my own boundaries are has also been important. Um, I'm always happy to be flexible and accommodating. I know folks have lives and that's important, but I also have to be accommodating to my own self, right. And making sure that I'm taking care of my own self. So yeah, trying to balance all of that. Within the past 10 years, you've been working in this field you worked for a school you work for a group practice nonprofit organizations ngos do you feel like you're being fairly compensated for what you do mm, that is a i love that question right because it'll constant it's hard yeah oh um i think i have been I think I've been fortunate in that I think I've been fairly compensated. Um, I also think that I've have I've made some choices that come from the privilege of being in a partnership and knowing that I have someone else, um, I have another income, right? And I don't have to worry about supporting myself or supporting children or supporting like a, a family member. Right. Um, and so I think if that was not the case, I think I might feel very differently. Right. Um, I, for example, right now in the, the group practice that I'm working, um, I'm making enough right right now. I, I made the choice to join a group practice knowing that I would make a little less money because, like I said, I get the benefits of somebody else's dealing with um, all the administrative stuff. They deal with advertising. They pay for the rent on the um, office space that I use. Right. The result is that I make less money, right? I get less take home pay, right? Um, but for me, that felt like a fair trade off, right? Um, because I have a partner and I get, you know, I live in the United States, so I get health insurance through him. Um, if I didn't have that, this would not be a sustainable career, right? Being in private practice and relying on like health and relying on like, uh, insurance payments and things like that it's really hard you know i talk to a lot of folks and it will not surprise you know a lot of us have partners who work and who provide us with health insurance and other benefits so that we can afford to work a little less because the reality is right if you're a therapist it's unsustainable to work 35 40 hours a week right it's it's overwhelming and it would be really people do it and it burns them out right to see for, i could not see 40 patients a week right um because i by the end i would just be completely like mentally um exhausted um but so then the trade-off is like okay well then how do i make enough to afford uh rent and again health insurance because we do not have any national health insurance right in this country um and uh taxes and make sure i'm saving for retirement and all of those things right um and it is a really tricky balance right because um do we take just private pay right so we're just charging people 200 300 an hour right well then that winds up eliminating a lot of people who can't afford that every single week right um but then maybe if we're just relying on uh insurance compensation right that's not really enough when you take into consideration taxes and again if you want to have like a an office to see people in person um you know and the rent and all of that kind of stuff um so i don't feel that that therapy is the most uh fairly compensated profession unless right you're doing like i do i have this other job and like we're piecing together other types of of income right maybe we're consulting or we're teaching 
right? Um, you have to piece it together from other places because I think it's really hard to, to try and make a living off of like 20 hours, 25 hours a week. Um, again, unless you're just like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to charge people 200, three hundred dollars an hour and call it a day, right? Which people do. I'm not judging anyone who does that, um, but it is going to kind of limit who who you see, right? Absolutely, and especially living in a big, dynamic, but expensive city like New York. Yeah, absolutely. You can do that as well. What is the pay that is out there on the market? You know, maybe not for the job that you are doing, but let's say an entry level specialist wanted to work for a group practice or an NGO in New York right now. What should they expect to be paid mm. for? I would say you should be aiming for like sixty, seventy thousand dollars as an entry level. Um much less than that is like not sustainable really um i do see terrible terrible fees right i see a lot less than that i see people trying to get away with like 50 45 50 and that's like uh, embarrassing and nobody should be settling for that right i would say you should be aiming for at least 60 70 um and then if you're you know licensed like i am you know hopefully 80 90 you know if you're someone who's trying to be like a director right you, you want to work in like an agency for example yeah you know, 100 110 120 um you should be expecting something you know and it, it's a trap because a lot of times right ngos will say well we're only getting so much money from the government or from our funders right so we can only pay you this much i am sympathetic and also, part of your role is you have to go to your funders, you have to go to the government and say to recruit the best candidates to provide the best services, we need to be able to pay them this base level salary, right? Um, and if you're not going to give us that, then we're not going to be able to fulfill this contract, right? So there has to be, I think NGOs have to take a bit of a firmer stand and be willing to risk losing a contract um, in the interest of recruiting like the best candidates in order to provide the best services for everyone, right? And too often I think they cede that power to the funders and they're like, well, what are you going to do? Um, and then what happens is we have this cycle of you recruit people and they don't get paid very well and then they leave or they get burnt out and then like everyone just, you know, feels miserable and we're trapped in this terrible cycle. You had to get your bachelor's, then you yeah. had to get your master's, mm -hmm. then you also finished a program in 2021. You got your license to be now um, a therapist and to have the practice going on it seems like even your journey required a lot of investment yeah do you feel like there is a return on that investment do you feel like looking back you would do something differently that's a really great question um i mean i kind of wish i'd gone back to grad school a little bit earlier honestly i think i spent a lot of time a little bit in the wilderness feeling like i didn't really know what i wanted to do and um a little uh, you know i i first of all i wish i had spent a little bit more time researching and i wish i'd known that psychology was not the only track if you wanted to help people right you can get a, a bachelor's degree in social work i didn't know that at the time um and so maybe that would have been the direction to go right would have been to like get a bachelor's in social work and then uh, get a master's in social work and then start a little bit earlier i'm not necessarily sorry that i i don't think i i would have wanted to go to grad school immediately i'm glad that i've had some life experience like i think that's important for anyone but especially a therapist i think it's great for therapists to have some life experience right because again not that my job is to like provide advice but i i think a therapist who comes in and says like yeah i know what it's like to be 25 right and not know what you're doing um is someone that you can kind of trust right versus someone who's like yeah i know it was like to be 25 i had my graduate degree and i was like providing therapy and giving people a you don't know anything when you're 25 years old right so i'm glad that i had some life experience but i do wish that i trusted myself a little bit more and gone back to grad school a little bit earlier um 
that's that's the one thing I wish I'd done a little bit more. And I wish that maybe right as an undergraduate, um, I had explored a little bit more, maybe some internships, right? Like known that like the the psychology program at my college was not like the only way to go, right? Like it was very researchy, it was very science focused, and I wish I'd known like, oh, this is not the only this isn't the only way to do psychology. There's a lot of other things that you could do, um, but you know. It's hard, right? Like you're in an academic program and academics know academics, right? Um, I think there's been an effort at my college and other colleges to be a little bit more vocationally focused in the last few years, which I appreciate because most of us are, we're not gonna become academics. We're gonna become, we're gonna go out into the field. Um, I think that's the big thing that I wish. I just wish I'd started a little bit, a little bit earlier. Um, and maybe wish, you know, I, I it's hard to say, you know, I, uh, COVID, I think kind of messed a little, things mm -hmm. up a little bit for everybody, you know, maybe, maybe I wish I'd left my agency a little bit sooner, you know, I, I was starting to get a little bit burned out, but I do think COVID kind of like delayed things a little bit. Cause I was kind of like, well, let's kind of like stay, you know, kind of like ride it out maybe another year or so and kind of like see them through this like crisis. Right. Even though I was kind of already starting to feel a little bit like done. Um, but you know, hindsight's hindsight's twenty twenty. Um, yeah, I think those are the two things. Twenty twenty was a wild year for everyone. I know. I will understand you. You know, talking about the past, there are some things that you might have been doing differently at the time. But then, what about the future? Do you have plans for the future? And what are your next career steps? Yeah, right. Love it. Um, as you may have heard from listening to me, a lot of my career has kind of been like, I don't know. And then just as things happen, just kind of going with it. Um, so, you know, I, uh, as I mentioned, right, I've, I've had a lot of folks who are neurodivergent, which has been really great. So I've been trying to learn a lot more about that um, and get some trainings in that. Um, right now, I'm kind of at this place of trying to decide, like, you know, Am I staying in a group practice? Am I maybe moving and, and doing my own private practice? Um, I'm actually really, you know, as part of my sort of political philosophy, I'm really interested in the idea of cooperative practices, right? Um, I think cooperatives really offer a unique model, not just in like the therapeutic space, but just as a general kind of economic model. Um, because I think what often happens, especially in the mental health field, right, is right. So like you do your time, and then, right, you can go into private practice or you open a group practice. And then a lot of times that becomes a little bit exploitative because like, you're like, well, I'm running the group practice. So like, I'm gonna like pay people kind of the bare minimum I can get away with. Cause like, I'm taking on all the risk and doing the work. So I'm like enriching myself that way, right? And I don't love that. Like that doesn't feel great. Um, but as I mentioned, like therapy can be kind of a lonely profession. And I also don't love that either. I don't necessarily want to be just sitting on my own somewhere. And so I kind of like the idea of a cooperative where, you know, there's a there's therapists kind of together, like jointly invested in, you know, working towards this goal, right? Of providing therapy um, to folks right with maybe like a similar kind of mission right we're like jointly like invested in it um so sharing the cost sharing the burden nobody's like in charge and making it um so that's a, an idea that i'm kind of been kicking around and exploring and, and could see myself doing in the next few years it's hard there's very few cooperatives um the united states in general, and New York in particular does not make it easy to open cooperatives, um, but there has been kind of a growing movement in the last few years as people are kind of exploring alternatives. Um, there are, um, there's one therapy cooperative in New York um, that's opened, and so um, that's an exciting model. Um, so that's something I'm, I've been looking into. So that's kind of, that's one way that I've seen myself um, going. Um, I've also kind of thought of, you know, maybe moving into that space of like teaching, I think could be kind of interesting. Um, of course, right, there's a that other barrier of a lot of places want you to have like your PhD, um, which, frankly, I find a little insulting to PhDs, because I'm like, you go through all that work, and you're just going to become an adjunct and make like nothing. Um, but uh, I liked, you know, I, I liked a lot of my professors, and I really liked the ones actually who were not PhDs, who had a lot of clinical experience, because I learned, I learned so much from folks who could come in and share from their experience of providing therapy, and again, being in the world, right, and what that was like. Um, so those are 
some of the some of my ideas. But again, like, I think I've really benefited from just kind of being open to what's out there and what the opportunities are. And so I'm a little bit open to whatever the universe is willing to to throw my way. If somebody today, for example, ask your opinion, what does it take to be a good trauma therapist or a therapist or a social worker in general? What skills it takes? What education it takes? What would you say? Great, great question. Ooh, uh, I think, you know, um, certainly compassion, right? I think compassion, I think, uh, a stance of curiosity is really important. Curiosity um, for the clients, but also curiosity for yourself, right? I think we always need to be interrogating our own sort of assumptions and beliefs. Um, and so if I'm coming in with uh, thinking, I know what a client needs to do, well, why? What's informing that, right? Um, am I listening to the client and what they're telling me or, or do I think that I'm the expert, right? Um, so always being willing to interrogate, you know, your own perspective, your own way of seeing the world, right? And always being willing to listen to what other people are, are sharing with you about their way of seeing things right and interrogate your assumptions um one of the reasons that i um have become so open to and so interested in learning about like neurodivergence is i just kept having clients kind of come in and what i started really hearing and people would come in with like anxiety and depression and i was just like you know, I'm missing something here, right? It just doesn't sound like traditional anxiety and depression, right? And listen, I know that there's this, the, a concern that like, oh, everyone's just like on TikTok and like Reddit and diagnosing themselves and like, fine. But I also really think it's important that if you are a therapist, a social worker, we are not the gatekeepers, right? It's it's made up. The, the DSM, right? The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual or the ICD, which is like the International like Diagnostic Manual. These things are made up by people, right? Like this is not some universal thing. We took a bunch of symptoms and we stuck a label on them, right? And mm -hmm. so if people are out there and they're reading these symptoms and they're saying like, oh, that kind of resonates with me. I think maybe that's my experience. Um, who are we to say like, no, right? I, that's not true. Um, clients don't come in and tell us everything about their lives. You know what I mean? Like they don't come in and tell us everything unless we are asking them about it. And so a big part of being a therapist and being an effective social worker is really like listening and paying attention. And if we feel like we're missing something or something's not adding up, like being willing to ask, to look deeper and like shift the paradigm, right? Try and like shift the frame. What is it that we're missing, right? I... Uh, I have ADHD and for a long time, my husband would say to me, like, I think you have ADHD. And I was like, oh, that's not true. I don't have ADHD. Um, and then I finally was like, okay, I got to fix like COVID actually like broke me because I was like falling apart. And I finally looked into it and I was like, I have ADHD. My therapist had not diagnosed me with that, but it's because I had never brought any of these symptoms to her because I never realized that they were symptoms, right? I just felt like they were failings. I thought they were problems of mine that I just, I needed to figure out on my own. They were like a, an issue of myself, right? And so they didn't feel worth it to bring up to her. And then I started to be, oh no, this is a symptom. This is a real thing, right? And I say that to say like, as therapists, as, we have to remember that people are the experts on their own lives. And that it's so, so important that you are providing people the space to explore with you. Hey, I think something is going on with me. Can we talk about it? Right. Um, and that you are non-judgmental, that you are open, that you are willing to listen, um, that you are curious, that you are compassionate, um, that you are not jumping into solutions, um, that you are not panicking. 
right? If somebody tells you something about uh, risky behavior that we don't panic immediately and say, like, oh my God, I'm going to call the EMT to take you to the hospital. Um, that we try and understand why. What's motivating that behavior? What's driving it? What can we maybe do to implement some, uh, you know, maybe make it a little less risky, a little safer for you, right? Um, but try and understand why. Right. Um, so I think those are, are all the things that I would say make a good therapist, a good social worker. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more that I could add, but that's that's what's coming up for me in, in this moment. And as you tell, my ADHD brain went in like 15 different directions to get back to the original it was, point. It was very insightful. And I do really appreciate it because I think that uh, oftentimes people do normalize things that they think should be normal but then in reality it could be a symptom of something completely different and so yep. i totally agree with you just speak up don't be afraid and don't be afraid of judgment because we are here to help absolutely um it was a pleasure to have you on this podcast sir thank you so much for this insightful conversation and absolutely. i wish you a good day Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure being here and meeting you. Thank you so much. We are always looking for guests of various backgrounds for our next episode. If you would like to be a guest, please email us at occupationinsightstv, one word, at gmail.com.